everybody reporting to you again from the glamour city Hollywood. The energy savings and the sales of CO2 in, in let's say, $250 per ton. So, so that would be in the, in the range that it would be beneficial already. Uh, today, of course, the, the cost is a little bit higher, but, uh, but uh, if you consider that you could get higher rent from the uh, tenants within the building when, when the building is net zero and maybe get a green financing on the building. So those, those will be that we, we are already today, just a few years payback on the system and, and then, then it would be yielding money after that. If you love listening to this show, please consider giving a rating and a review on Amazon Alexa or wherever you listen. We want to continue bringing you this amazing content, and part of our ability to do that means that we need a big audience. Now, it may not seem like much, but rating and reviewing the show will help more people find us, just like how you found this show. Simply on any podcast platform, search for a show, scroll down to the bottom, and push five stars. It's that easy. Thanks for supporting the show. Today, I'm joined by Petri Loxo, CEO and co-founder of Soltair Power. Welcome to the show today. Thank you. All right. So there are currently a lot of direct air capture startups like Climeworks, Heirloom, Carbon Engineering, to name a few. How is your approach to direct air capture different? I think our approach is different because we, we are building the world's biggest distributed direct air carbon capture. And, and if you think about the single place in the world where you already ventilate the needed amount of air, that's the buildings what we have built here, uh, let's say globally. So that's that's the biggest difference compared to others, I think. All right, so we're gonna get into that in, in just a second. Now I'm gonna ask a very fundamental question, which is for us to really make a dent around climate action, we have to address the the carbon capture and the sequestration. This is critical. It's not enough that we reduce emission. However, with that said, it's it's a bit of a it's a bit of a challenge. However, you look at it, because for us to make any true sizable dents, and 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 some of the startups that I mentioned before, again, they have ambitious plans for large footprints, but you would have to have potentially, in my opinion. I mean, millions of these units around the world for it to make any difference whatsoever. Now, with that said, it's also sexy because it's a standalone approach that captures there, right? And it's essentially a factory that's built for that purpose. Here, you're taking advantage of something that already exists. So from, a, from, a, from an economics, it's, it's beautiful. But I wonder from a storytelling, how that resonates with investors. Yeah, the storytelling is, of course... Uh... I would say challenging because uh, to name Climeworks, they are kind of the market leader and, and they try to build really big systems. Uh, but we, our first unit back in 2017 was an outdoor unit. And we kind of found out that the, uh, the economics is not there if you just capture the CO2 and, and, and utilize it further. And, and that's why we kind of pivoted in the buildings because with our technology, you can actually save energy within the building. So even though our system uses energy, but when you reduce the fresh air ventilation, because we capture the CO2 away, that that enables actually energy savings within the buildings. And, and, and buildings are related to 38% of global mm -hmm. CO2 emissions. Mm -hmm. So if we can reduce the energy consumption, this way we kind of avoid also emissions. And on top of that, we make the negative emissions through direct air capture in buildings. We think that's the winning winning uh, uh, solution. And, and why is that is, of, of course, that many real estate investors want to be net zero and, and and tenants want to avoid their scope three emissions and and this also serves that business so so helping building owners to get to net zero and and uh, tenants to avoid their scope three emissions so so it's it's like a much more beneficial in economical way than than normal direct air carbon capture outdoors yeah so we kind of dove right into sol Soltair Power and your approach. And again, I think in many ways, it's very elegant because you're leveraging something that already exists. It's an existing infrastructure and you're tapping into it. And the other thing is when the CO2 is captured, 
it is then put into containers and supplied to concrete manufacturers for permanent storage. And is that also part of your economics as well? Yeah, we, we've spoken to several of these companies, which basically are also startups that, that could utilize the CO2 in concrete manufacturing. And, and uh, they don't have a, a kind of a feed for the green CO2, what oh, direct air capture can provide. So we, we could provide that for them. And, and uh, in every city of the world or town, you have a concrete manufacturing facility. So the distance for transportation is not that, that long. And, and for example, with one, uh, let's say, concrete material provider, we've discussed that their business model is actually to store the CO2 and have the logistics to their customer and utilize the CO2. So, so th there would be the, let's say, the value chain already built uh, with us and them to, to operate for the uh, end customers. All right, so let's get into a little bit more granular in terms of your carbon capture technology. So tell us exactly how it works. Yeah, we use uh, a solid sorbent, uh, which is amine functionalized. Uh, we use low temperature heat. That's also quite different than what, what the other ones are doing so that we can utilize the heating infrastructure of a building and a normal heat pump. So so if you use a heat pump, the, the total energy taken from the grid is, is much, much smaller. Uh, temperature swing, vacuum absorption, like, like many other companies. And, and this way we can make really pure, like 99.9 .9 or above purity CO2. So, so that's uh, technology in a nutshell, I would say. Okay. So t walk me through how would the implementation go? Who, who do you work with and what are the components that has to get installed? Yeah, uh, so far we've delivered six systems, uh, seventh one coming up quite soon in Denmark. So uh, we, we work with the different R&D institutes, real estate owners, uh, real estate investors, and, and even tenants in those cases that we have currently running up. And, and what needs to go into the building is, of course, the direct air capture module plus the gas treatment train. So the gas treatment train is the one that uh, takes out the CO2, uh, takes the moisture away or humidity away, and, and then compresses the CO2 into a tank. So quite a few equipment, of course, needs to be in a, in a building, but we have a modular system that it can be tailored to any ventilation uh, volume that you have in buildings. Typically, they are, let's say different in sizes, even in, in the same, within the same building, you may have even tens of ventilation unit in, in, in a single building, if so it's a high rise building. Yeah, so you're re referring to your power to X methane production module, is that right? Uh, no, actually I was just talking about the direct air carbon capture. Then if somebody wants, wants uh, utilize the CO2 for, for making fuels, we can of course provide third party equipment for the for the hydrogen pr production, meaning electrolyzer and the synthesis, uh, but that's that's like an add-on. If somebody is interested into that, uh, we we kind of firmly think that when you capture it within the building, you should do the negative emissions through the mineralization in the concrete process. Now, the components that you're talking about are these off the shelf, or what components are your specific IP and things that's been designed for your your patents? Or uh, our our main patent is about the uh, the method of capturing CO two within the building uh, and utilizing that CO two. Then, of course, the kind of the, the the design of our system and and the software and everything behind it is is like built by us. Then, like vacuum pumps and normal water circulation pumps and these kind of things, they are basically like off the shelf uh, components. But the the kind of the core of the direct air capture is is uh, our design and. Uh, and, and I, I would say also that how you run the system is is also affecting on, on the yield that how much CO2 you capture, how much energy you consume. So talk to us about some of the, the some of the metrics around costs as well as uh, the kind of volume of CO2 that's captured per, per volume of air. Yeah, you, roughly if, if we start with volume of air, you need to ventilate right uh, 1.7 million cubic meters of air in order to capture one ton of CO2. So here in Finland, like a 2000 square meter office, uh, you need like 157 hours of ventilation running in order to capture uh, uh, the that amount of uh, CO2. So basically 
if you ventilate on, on a high level 13 hours a day, that's like, I don't know, 12, 13 days that you are able to capture from that single office uh, the ton of CO2. That's that's the kind of ugly truth uh, that every darker uh, startup needs to obey. You just need to ventilate a lot. Uh, and just one fact is that if you if you take all the air that has been ventilated in the buildings, we could capture four gigatons of CO2 even today. And when humankind builds another set of buildings by 2050, you can double that. So so there's potential there. Uh, and the four, uh, could you remind the first part of the question was uh, was about the um, yeah in terms of in terms of cost. So yes, you were exactly. to try to compare yourself against let's say ClimateWorks, ClimateWorks. Yeah. Uh, well, operational costs, of course, since we are saving energy within the building, I mean, net saving, of course, we are consuming, but we are saving more within the building. So operational cost is basically negative. That That is the uh, kind of the benefit that we can offer for the building owner. Uh, then in terms of, uh, uh, let's say, uh, capital cost, uh, of course, when we build a little bit smaller systems, uh, that is a little bit higher. Uh, we have a target by 2030 to go into, let's say, below $400 per ton of capture. And, and that, that would be just uh, when we calculate the, the, uh, the, the energy savings and the sales of CO2 in, in let's say, $250 per ton. So, so that would be in, in the range that it would be beneficial already. Uh, today, of course, the, the cost is a little bit higher, but, uh, but uh, if you consider that you could get higher rent from the uh, tenants within the building when, when the building is net zero and maybe get a green financing on the building. So those, those will be that we, we are already today just a few years payback on the system and, and then, then it would be yielding money after that. So that was my follow up question is, does your model work outside of incentives and, and like tax and, uh, and credits, for example? Yeah, because uh, if, if you think about the building and they want to get negative emissions within the building, they, they basically, if you form the credits, they would basically retire those. So you are not selling the credits. On some areas, uh, I don't know if you go into uh, US and Houston, for example, or Texas in general, it might be that the, the credits are not that important yet for the building owners. But I'm quite sure that in the in the future, those those are important. And, and for example, in Denmark here in Europe, uh, the legislation is such that uh, it, it starts to be difficult to make a building that obeys the legislation to be low low energy and low emission class building. And and and, and you could utilize our technology like like the, the Danish case that we are building is utilizing our negative emissions as a net uh, emissions on the building. So, so even only with that, you can make it uh, work the business model. And and one of our potential customers was calculating that the, if if in a couple of years they just increase the rent by one percent only, that makes the business case successful with no subsidies, nothing else, just that, just one percent added rent into the building. So so you don't need incentives necessarily. I mean tax credits or something like this. So the the primary driver for property owners, managed managers is really because they want to avoid having to incur the cost of carbon credits. Is that correct? Yeah. If 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 you want to get to net zero within the buildings, there's a plenty of pledges out there. How do you actually achieve that? I, I used to be in the solar business here in Finland and uh, uh, in the only publicly listed company. And so if you run the building with renewables, you are not going to be net zero because renewables are net, not net zero emission. There's no such thing as net zero electricity. So basically, you will always have emissions. You need to get rid of those in order to be truly net zero. And and with our technology, you can you can kind of even out those. And and then the construction also of the building causes emissions, and you can cancel out those also with our technology. So so this is the basic kind of a why somebody would be doing this. Of course, the energy savings is one because HVAC, so heating, ventilation, and air conditioning is like 40% in general, uh, globally, uh, the energy out of the co energy consumption of a building. So if we can drop half of that away, it saves a lot of energy also. So th those are kind of the primary reasons why somebody would, would do that. So I want to come back to the, the question that I started with, which really is around 
carbon uh, capture and sequestration is so critical for us to really get a handle on this climate change. However, really what we're talking about is more from a benefit from a building per building kind of a micro unit, so to speak. In other words, the buildings are going to emit certain carbon. You guys are able to capture that, store it, sequester that. But we're not really making a difference when it comes to the carbon that's already out there in the environment. Is that right? Well, it depends a little bit how you think about it. Uh, for example, our installation here in uh, Finland, in Vasa, it's on the West Coast. We capture the CO2 from incoming air and, and we take out almost all of the CO2 and then we blow close to zero BPM into the building. So we basically take out the ambient CO2 uh, from the air. So it's, it's kind of cleaning the air, I mean, the building itself. Then our uh, other installation, it's close to Helsinki, our capital here in Finland. We are, we are uh, kind of removing CO2 from the air that exits the building. So, for example, one day I was visiting a the site, there was like 600 ppm coming out of the offices. There was only a few people inside and we were blowing 150 ppm into the outdoor and outdoor is like 420. So basically these buildings are like cleaning the outdoor air. So, so they are removing the CO2 uh, as we speak. So, so it, it really makes a difference. And, and if the buildings are 38% of global CO2 emissions and we can make buildings as carbon sinks, it means that it's, it's a huge part of the climate change that we need to do, but of course, a massive uh, uh, deployment also of the technology. So, so the challenge that I see is that, um, again, the, the reason that um, your solution would be purchased or procured is because of the things that we talked about that benefits the property owner, the manager. However, for it to really make a net difference on a global scale, from a prioritization, it needs to work in the dirtiest parts of the world that is heavily polluted because you really want to think about not just what is coming out of buildings, but what is going into buildings because the environment of some of these industrialized metro areas are so dirty that you want to be able to actually suck in some of those CO2 in that process. So can you talk to us about, I know you have some implementa implementation in Dubai, Finland, as an example, Germany, but can you talk to us about maybe places in, you know, East Asia, Southeast Asia, or other parts of the world that is heavily polluted? Yeah, I think Singapore would be really, really interesting place for us uh, because it's, I don't know, a gateway to Asia. Uh, they are really green there. Uh, even if, So so they, they are ahead of many of European countries. So so working there would be would be really, really good for us. But of course, we are a startup. Uh, we cannot go globally yet. That's why we are serving the Northern Europe now and uh, plans to go to US at some point at least. So, so I see a lot of potential being there in in uh, in in Singapore, for example. Uh, why why not other places like Hong Kong, which is densely populated and lot of lot of uh, buildings. And and why this is also interesting for building owners is that uh, there's a JLL. Uh, they are a real estate as asset manager. Their CEO was saying that uh, there's a demand for green buildings. Mm. And, and by 2030, uh, the, the, there is like 70% more demand than supply. And, and we have a kind of a solution for that, that uh, we, we can make buildings as uh, net zero. So, so in, in we, we are targeting office buildings. And, and in, in bigger cities, that is, that is what you have. Uh, we are not saying that we would be in, a, in a, somebody's own house in a suburban area. That's not the place where to start with. It's the office buildings. Yeah, and I agree with that. And and to that point, I, I think the, one of the really fundamental questions that I have to ask is, because the future is that of green buildings, the current manufacturers of HVAC systems, heat pumps, air conditioning units, they will be incented to make their machines much more carbon neutral or carbon negative. So what would preclude or prevent them from replicating what you're doing, if not just outright buyer technology? Because so much of it is fairly off the shelf. Yeah, I would say since we've been around 2017, uh, of course, if some company decides to do so, they might be able to replicate what we are doing. 
but maybe it would be just easier to buy a kind of a, a startup away mm -hmm. to start uh, not not to start from the scratch of course we have the patent granted in in us and here in europe so that that covers at least something uh yeah. but uh in in business you can always go around the patents that's uh that's uh, quite common but i think this this starts to be the mainstream quite uh in in few years time i i think i was last year in us in atlanta there was a, a department of energy event that they that they were thinking about how about if we put dark air capture in the in the building ventilation and i was there as, a, as one of the speakers so so answer to a question that yeah somebody might do that but maybe they would like to work with us first because we've been doing this for a while and and uh, maybe somebody is already closely following what we are doing let's say let's put it that way my final question is uh in the us we have certainly the inflation reduction act and there's been a number of policies that are very much um incenting growth as well as development of some of these types of technologies like uh for example electric based HVAC systems, you know, and, and heat pumps are critical, and there are tax, significant tax incentives. Now, of course, the overall costs are, are still high, but there's enough of an incentive where I think businesses as well as retail consumers are seriously considering or transitioning to it. What are your thoughts in terms of how do you enter the U.S. market and be able to take advantage of, of some of these policies and, and incentives? I think, uh, to be honest, uh, if if we were to enter the U.S. market, uh, we we would need a partner uh, because real estate business is is quite conservative. I think that if if we try to as a, a startup to sell equipment which has a lifetime of I don't know 10, 20 years, the the real estate owners would probably like to have a, a established company providing those services. So so. We are happy to talk to any any company that would like to partner with us, and and this way we could have a, a winning solution for the U.S. market. Uh, so, in minimum, it would require us, uh, let's say, a, a daughter company founded there in U.S. in order to start to to work there. But uh, so far, we we are quite happy here in Europe, and and looking some, let's say, test sites here and there in U.S. maybe in the future. Okay, sounds great. Fantastic. Anything else you want to add before we wrap it up for today? I think we had a pretty interesting discussion, uh, and I hope somebody gets uh, something out of it. Terrific. And with that, I have been joined by Petri Lakso, CEO of Solterra Power. Thanks for joining today. Thanks. If you've enjoyed this episode, take a moment to rate our show on any podcast platform that you listen to. Scroll down to the bottom and push five stars. It's that easy. And as always, thanks for listening.